morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, this Morrison's webinar on Section 29 of the Family Law Scotland Act 2006. My purpose in delivering this webinar to you today is, of course, the dissemination of information, but it's also, again, hopefully to demonstrate to those who uh, view this webinar that my firm has a range of skills which uh, we are happy to uh, share with you in a consultancy or other basis. Uh, I will now simply commence my seminar on Section 29, which is a highly criticised piece of legislation and which, as we will see as we go through today's webinar, is likely to be changed at some point in the future. I'll come back to the possible changes and just when they might take place later on today. But Section 29 applies where a cohabitant dies intestate and immediately before their death they were domiciled in Scotland and cohabiting with another cohabitant. The section allows the court to make an order for payment to the survivor out of the deceased's net intestate estate of a capital sum of such amount as may be specified in the order, or for transfer to the survivor of such property, whether heritable or movable, from that estate as may be so specified. Section 29 sets out the matters which the court must take into account in relation to fixing a judgment. Um, and these are the size and nature of the deceased's met and tested estate, any benefit received or to be received by the survivor on or in consequence of the deceased's death and from somewhere other than the deceased's net intestate estate. The court must also take into account the nature and extent of any other rights against or claims on the deceased's net intestate estate and any other matter which the court considers to be appropriate. In passing, I would say that that particular provision of section 29 has been the subject of particular criticism. Early criticism of the section can be found in an article which is detailed in my printed notes, which will be available to you on application. The article is by Tom Guthrie and Hilary Hiram, and it appeared in the Edinburgh Law Review in 2007. The article is entitled Property and Cohabitation, Understanding the Family Law Scotland Act 2006. Guthrie and Hiram stated, and I'm going to quote for them because I think it's a relevant quote, the notion that the 2006 Act introduces a new dawn of legal certainty and clarity is problematic for a number of reasons some of which are explored in this paper. Further, the suggestion that the reforms are motivated by and directed towards the achievement of fairness contains a number of sub-themes that serve rather to conflate the issues and confuse the basic question of what the reforms are for. One of those sub-themes is fairness, per se, seemingly based on the intuitive view that whilst not wishing to give cohabitation the same status as marriage, there was something wrong with the law which, for example, gave no rights to claim from property left on the death of a partner, even after a lifelong cohabitation. Perhaps the very first hurdle which uh, has to be crossed by an individual wishing to claim under Section 29 is that they require to demonstrate that they were indeed a cohabitant. Uh, and put another way, the party in question has to satisfy the court that they were a cohabitant in terms of Section 25 of the Act. And again, uh, Guthrie and Hiram in the article in question are critical, as are many others, of the drafting of Section 25. Guthrie and Hiram state, The fundamental difficulty with the legislation lies in the uncertainty as to when a couple living together are to be regarded as cohabiting and thus entitled to make claims on the termination of the relationship. The requirement of section 25.1 that they are living together as husband and wife or civil partners are added other factors set out in section 25.2 which the court must consider in determining whether the parties are or have been cohabitants. First is the length of the relationship. 
Although a minimum period of two years was set out in an early draft of the bill, the Act as passed does not prescribe any minimum period and it is presumably possible that a very short relationship could qualify as a statutory cohabitation depending on the court's assessment of other factors. There are very few reported cases on Section 29. I will be looking at virtually all of them today, but in one of them, Savage against Purchase, if I mention a case, there is a full case citation for that case in my notes. Uh, a period of cohabitation of approximately two and a half years was considered by the court to be sufficient. The second factor is the nature of the relationship. According to the Scottish Executive, this is a quote from the Scottish Executive, by nature we seek to point towards those many factors, not all of which may be present in any given relationship, which reflect a common life. These might include financial arrangements, the use and maintenance of a joint home, the existence of and caring for any children of the relationship, any outward signs of commitment, the manner in which the couple present themselves as a couple to friends and wider family, and evidence of decisions or actions reflecting expectations by the parties that they would remain a couple. Sorry, couple. The final factor is the nature and extent of any financial arrangements, the focus here being on evidence of financial interdependence. Even with the additional gloss on the definition set out in Section 25 of the Act, the legislation still leaves considerable doubt as to the full range of factors which may be relevant, as well as to the precise scope and meaning of the terms specifically used within the Act. In the light of uncertainties about the essential nature of marriage, such as were highlighted by a recent sham marriage case, including whether marriage is a matter of bare legal form, how consent is to be construed, whether cohabitation is necessary, and how outward signs are to be interpreted, it is hardly surprising that providing a legal definition of cohabitation is no easy matter. As a consequence of social change, cohabitants no longer uh, feel the need to hold themselves out as a married couple. Moreover, the definition of cohabitant, even as expanded by Section 25.2, suffers from precisely the same problems that led to the abolition of marriage by habit and repute. What is sufficient length of cohabitation? I've already mentioned the case of Savage against Purchase. What if one party denies that he or she ever cohabited or intended to cohabit with the other, within the meaning of the Act? Cohabitation is agreed or established. At what date did it commence? As a qualifying condition for acquiring the status of cohabitant, and thus for certain sorts of property claims, cohabitation seems as, quote, inherently vague and unregulated, unquote, as a regular marriage. Since existence of legally recognised cohabitation is the foundation of other rights conferred in the Act, it is unfortunate that the definition remains obscure. It is an obscurity that one imagines will make it clear to give, sorry, will make it difficult to give clear legal advice in many instances. I have to say that that has been my uh, overwhelming experience of assisting with Section 29 claims. The great difficulty in doing so is that there are very few reported cases which give our profession a steer as to how the court is likely to interpret Section 29. Later this morning I will touch on the question of the experience of the vacationers in relation to Section 29 claims. They seem to have adapted um, and seem to be coping quite well with them, but whether or not the vacationer's uh, attitude is the experience of the profession in general is a different question. Um, Section 29 has been the subject of further criticism. In its discussion paper number 136 in succession in 2007, the Scottish Law Commission stated at paragraph 6, period 3-2, that section 29 can be criticised on two main grounds. First, the factors set out in section 29-3 to guide the court in exercise of its discretion are not sufficiently complete. 
and some of the factors we might expect to see there, such as the nature and length of the relationship, are instead in section 25.2, where they form part of the definition of a qualified cohabitant. Other factors that might be thought useful are the needs and resources of the applicant and other beneficiaries, any physical or mental disability of the applicant, the age of the applicant and the extent to which the applicant contributed to the welfare of the deceased in the family. On the other hand, there are dangers from having too long a list of factors. It may lead to a box ticking approach, so ignoring other factors which are important in the particular case under consideration. Furthermore, most of the factors listed above are fairly self-evident. The second and perhaps more fundamental criticism is that section 29 contains no aim. If the court is not told what it should be trying to achieve by making the award, how can it make the award? Merely adding factors would not help and may even confuse as they will not all point in the same direction. A more detailed ro roadmap is of no assistance to a walker who is not told the destination. Now that's fairly stinging criticism of section 29 um, and in my experience is completely justified. Many sheriffs in particular have found it difficult to assess what they were supposed to do with a claim under section 29 because if you look at the section it says that a cohabitant can make a claim against the intestate estate of their deceased partner but there are prior claims which must be met debts, taxes and the rights of any surviving spouse who is missing from that list? Well, it should be fairly obvious children particularly young children Sheriffs were asked to give effect to a legal provision which was counterintuitive from their experience. Because those, those of you who have been involved in any family law case will know that where children are involved, the prime uh, directive to the court is that the child's interest is paramount. And that's not reflected in section 29. And that, I think, has caused difficulty for judges. There are other important points to note in relation to section 29. The court has no discretion to extend the time limit of six months. Someone wishing to make a claim under section 29 must lodge their claim and serve it on the relevant parties within six months of the date of death. And one of the questions which has exercised uh, cohabitants wishing to make a claim and our profession is what happens where no one has come forward to be appointed as executive data within that time scale. Uh, what happens where the surviving cohabitant is the mother of the infant children of the deceased cohabitant? The mother will have the right to be appointed as executive date of quiet guardian to those children but also wishes to make a claim under section 29. That type of claim has arisen more often I think than the Scottish Law Commission envisaged. The right to claim is only available <clears throat> where the deceased died intestate. By comparison under the Inheritance, Family Provision and Dependence Act 1975 which applies in England and Wales, the a uh, claim can be made where the estate is either testate or intestate. When section 29 was being considered, the question of whether or not it should be extended to testate cases was also looked at, but the decision was taken that it would be better to introduce it, first of all, in respect only of intestate cases to see how the law developed. And it should be noted that the Scottish Law Commission is now in favour of the extension of Section 29 as amended to test eight cases. And that may also be the view of the Scottish Government. The possibility of Section 29 uh, being amended or restated is clearly set out 
in the Scottish Government's Consultation on the Law of Succession, which was published in June 2015. And I think I can say to you that uh, as a member of the Trust and Succession Subcommittee of the Law Society of Scotland, my committee was recently asked if there was one public policy priority issue which we would like to see legislated on sooner rather than later. And it was almost unanimous within our committee that Section 29 of the 2006 Act should be redrawn and restated. And I'll tell you just how I personally envisage that should be done later. I want now to have a brief consideration of the small number of reported cases in respect of Section 29. The first is Chabotareva against King's Executrix, which was decided by Sheriff Ward in Stirling Sheriff Court in March 2008. The claim made by the cohabitant was thrown out because it was clearly demonstrated that the deceased cohabitant had not been domiciled in Scotland at the time of his death. The sheriff found that the deceased had a domicile of origin in England and had retained that domicile as at his date of death. Uh, the second case, Savage against Purchase, also known as Savage against Boyce's Executors, sorry, Executor, uh, is a case from Falkirk Sheriff Court from December 2008, and it was decided by Sheriff P.A. Arthurson. Uh, Mr. Savage and Mr. Boyce were same-sex partners who had lived together for just over two and a half years. They had not registered a civil partnership, but at the age of 44, Mr. Boyce died in test aid. Uh, under the Succession Scotland Act 1964, his sole beneficiary was his sister, Sandra Purchase, and she had been appointed as executive dative. However, Mr. Savage raised a claim under Section 29 of the 2006 Act. The deceased's net intestate estate amounted to £186,000. However, he had been employed by BT at the time of his death and there had been a, a large death and service benefit payable which had been divided equally between Mr Savage and Mrs Purchase. They both received a sum of just under £125,000 from that death and service benefit. Savage was also awarded a pension of £8,000 net per annum and that had been actuarially valued at £298,000. So in value terms, Mr Savage had in fact received £400,000 from the deceased estate, but nonetheless, he wanted it all. In evidence, it was pointed out that Mr Boyce had enjoyed a 15-year relationship with another same-sex partner in which they had gone on holiday together, had joined bank accounts. Mr Boyce had made a will nominating his then partner as his beneficiary. They had done other things of that nature together. The, the relationship between Savage and Boise was void of any of these steps having been taken. Uh, the sheriff was critical of the pursuer and stated that he detected a, quote, whiff of avarice, unquote. And whilst the sheriff found that Mr Savage did qualify as a cohabitant under uh, Section 25 of the Act, uh, exercising his discretion and taking into account the sums which had already been earmarked or paid to Mr Savage, the Sheriff awarded him nil. Uh, the next reported case which I wish to draw to your attention is Windrum against Geo Capaz's executor, also known as Windrum Applicant, reported in 2009. Uh, in uh, that case decided by Sheriff Janice Scott, an award was made to the uh, applicant cohabitant in respect of the dwelling house and also £34,000. The dwelling house had been owned jointly by the applicant and her deceased partner. The deceased intestate estate consisted of uh, the property owned jointly with Miss Windrum, which had a value of £175,000 but was subject to a mortgage of just over £54,000. An amusement arcade with a flat above valued £170,000. Fixtures, furnishings and personal possessions valued at £2,000. Two Royal Bank of Scotland accounts having a combined value of £18,719. And a Royal Bank of Scotland bond having a value of just under £8,800. The total value of the deceased estate before deduction of the mortgage uh, 
was just under £375,000. Because of the size of his estate, uh, Mr Duke of Hatz's executor had to pay inheritance tax uh, to HMRC. Um, Miss Windham had received the benefit of a pension worth just over £25,000 on the life of uh, Mr Duke of Patsy. Um, but the interesting point here was that Mr Duke of Patsy and Miss Windham had two children, both aged under the, the age of 16. She had been appointed as executor date of Quai Guardian, but had also made a Section 29 application. The Sheriff took the view that it would be totally unfair not to award her anything because of the nature of the relationship they had been together for many years. And taking into account perhaps the needs of the children and the fact that they were the true beneficiaries of intestacy under the 1964 Act, the Sheriff awarded Mr Geo Capazzi's interest in the matrimonial home, if I can call it that, subject to the existing mortgage, but also awarded a sum of £34,000. Why did the Sheriff award the £34,000? Because taking into account the money received from the pension, the uh, applicant, Miss Windham, would be able to pay off the mortgage over the dwelling house. Uh, <clears throat> the Sheriff, in that case, obviously did take into account the pension payment received by Miss Windham. The fourth case is uh, not of great interest, Carrigan against McClung's executor, reported in 2010. Uh, the sheriff's got it in, but he decided the couple in question had not been living together as husband and wife, nor were they cohabiting immediately prior to Mr McClung's death, although they had enjoyed a sexual relationship since 1990. The next case I, I want to discuss with you is Kerr v Mangan, uh, originally reported in 2013. I think that this is an, a particularly important case uh, because of what was said particularly by Lady Smith and Lord Drummond Young in the inner house when this case eventually reached there. Margaret Kerr and Anthony Mangan had cohabited for 22 years. Uh, he was from Ireland. Uh, he was domiciled in Scotland on, on death. He had heritable property in Ireland. He also had some assets in Scotland, but he had sizeable debts. The surviving cohabitant, Margaret Kerr, made an application under Section 29, and in the first instance, the sheriff awarded her uh, a sum of just over £5,000. <clears> the sheriff held, in particular, that the right to apply under Section 29 was not a right of succession, as we know it. Margaret Kerr appealed to the sheriff principal, the Sheriff Principal uh, decided that he would award her nil because it appeared that the Sheriff at first instance had taken into account the value of the property in Ireland and property, heritable property in Ireland cannot be part of a deceased Scots intestate estate because the Succession Scotland Act 1964 clearly excludes foreign heritable property. Uh, Margaret Kerr appealed to the Inner House and was unsuccessful there. Uh, and the comments made by, as I said, Lady Smith and Lord Drummond Young are of particular importance. Uh, and I'm going to read out from Lady Smith's judgment, where she said, <coughs> Excuse me. It is, of course, true to say that Section 29 does not of itself entitle the cohabitant to any part of the estate and does not make a cohabitant a member of the class of persons upon whom intestate estate automatically devolves under Scots law. Rather, it gives power to the court to confer benefit on the cohabitant where no such right arose under the Scots law of succession before the 2006 Act. However, its provisions are clearly designed to enable a member of the family of the deceased who could not previously have benefited under the Scots law of succession to succeed to some part of the estate. That omission was seen as a flaw. Social circumstances had undergone a transformation since 1964 and statistics showed that many couples, including those who had lived together in family for many years, were, for whatever reason, not marrying. Had they been married, the law of succession would have applied so as to confer a benefit on the surviving spouse in the event of an intestate death. The same would have applied had they entered into a civil partnership. There was a gap that required to be filled in some way. The cohabitant ought to be able to inherit. 
That was the easy part. Precisely how to fill that gap raised and raises difficult issues of policy, some of which are referred to above. One of the things that was and is, however, clear is that what was identified was a hole, a hole in the law of succession. The conclusion that section, 20 form, so, sorry, section 29 reformed the law of succession and is accordingly a part of the Scots law of succession is inescapable. It is also, I would add, inherently unlikely that Parliament intended to, to establish a special regime that was independent of other legal categories for the reasons which are explained by Lord Drummond Young at paragraphs 45 and 46. Lady Smith also considered whether or not fairness was uh, something that felt to be considered in relation to a Section 29 claim. Um, and she indicated, and I quote substantially from her judgment, but I'm not going to read this out to you other than to say to you, she indicated that although Section 28 claims did uh, have an inherent element of fairness involved in them, there was no element of fairness whatsoever involved in deciding a Section 29 claim. Lord Drummond Young agreed with uh, Lady Smith, uh, and in his view, he stated that it was clear that Section 29 was concerned with the law of succession. Uh, I do wish to mention something of what Lord Drummond Young said, because I think it instructs some of the comments which I made earlier. He said, I accordingly agree that the appeal must be refused. In conclusion, I would like to associate myself with your Ladyship's observations in paragraphs 17 to 19 about the serious problems that arise in relation to the application of section 29. The lack of statutory criteria for an award makes the task of the court extremely difficult, as was revealed in the consultations that led to the Scottish Law Commission's report and succession of 2009. In my view, this is Lord Drummond Young, reform of the law in this area is clearly desirable. Full stop. Uh, the problems which have arisen and which my firm has had to face largely arise not from the arguments about what the cohabitant should be entitled to, but the situation where there has been no executor in, put in place. Uh, the first time my firm encountered that, uh, it was quite obvious the family were deliberately holding back from having an executor appointed in the hope that our client would uh, not raise their claim within the statutory time limit. Um, we raised the action on the basis of cognitionis causa tantum, i.e. we established who the beneficiaries on intestacy were and we called them as the defenders. Um, we've done that several times. On no occasion has that been challenged by the other side. And I think it uh, useful to note that Kerr v Mangan, the original action was raised in the Sheriff Court on the basis of cognitionis causa tantum. The, the competency of that basis has been called into question in a couple of cases in Edinburgh Sheriff Court, uh, both in 2016, XVA and XVA number two. Uh, there's a detailed commentary on those two cases in my notes, but suffice it to say that on both occasions, Sheriff Holligan took the view that it was quite competent to raise a Section 29 claim on the basis of cognitionis causa tantum. Um, the importance of complying with the time limit can be seen in relation to uh, the case of Henry against Bruce, which is an unreported case from uh, Hamilton Sheriff Court. Stuart Bruce died in testy on 15th November 2012. Uh, his entire estate fell to his children under the laws of intestacy. Uh, however, his surviving cohabitant, Morag Henry, raised the claim under Section 29. Um, the action was warranted and served, but was not received by the defenders until the day after the six month time limit had expired. There was an argument about whether or not the action had been properly raised because it had been warranted within the six month time limit, but the court took the view that the action had to be raised and served within the six month time limit and Morag Henry's claim failed. Uh, the very strict attitude which our courts take towards time limits in relation to 
claims under the Family Law Scotland Act can be seen in relation to the case of Courtney's executors against Campbell, 2016. Um, that was a Section 28 claim, but I think the attitude of the court towards the one-year time limit in that particular case and the six-month time limit in a Section 29 claim will be one and the same, so I would encourage you to have a look at Courtney's executors against Campbell. Um, the, uh, I mentioned another couple of cases in relation to uh, Section 29 claims, another decision of Sheriff Holligan in uh, Edinburgh Sheriff Court, X and Y Petitioners, 2017. This case revolved around an application by the executors of an individual who had died intestate to be appointed as trustees in respect of two deeds of trust which had been signed by the deceased and returned to the relevant insurance company. The cohabitant had raised an action under Section 29. The, co the cohabitant claimed that the trust had not been fully constituted and that the executor dative should not be allowed to become trustees of the two trustees. In effect, the cohabitant argued that the proceeds of the two insurance policies fell to be regarded as part of the deceased's intestate estate against which the cohabitant's claim could be made. The cohabitant was successful in that argument. Um, what changes do require to be made to Section 29? Um, I take the view that Section 29, the time limit, is misstated. And I have argued this point with Scottish Law Commissioners. The present time limit is six months from the date of death. The court has no discretion on any grounds to extend that time limit. I have argued that the point from which the six month time limit should run should not be fixed by reference to the date of death, but should be fixed by reference to the date upon which confirmation is granted. And I have two reasons for saying that. The first is, it is quite clear to me that families have deliberately refrained from having somebody appointed as an executor in the hope that that will frustrate the attempt of the surviving cohabitant to successfully raise a claim under Section 29. The second is that the law in Scotland and England would appear to be different. Uh, under the Act which I've already mentioned, the Inheritance, Family Provision and Dependence Act of 1975, there is a six months time limit to raise the claim. However, that six months time limit is fixed by reference to the grant of probate or the grant of letters of administration. The grant of probate is made when there is a will, i.e. The, the estate is testate. Letters of administration is the equivalent of a Scottish intestacy and the grant of confirmation therein. Why should we be different from England? I think that the law should be restated and the time limit, whatever it is, should be fixed by reference to the date of grant of confirmation. I also believe that uh, the suggestion that the Act be extended to test eight cases is not what I could personally support. Now, I emphasise I'm expressing a personal view here and you are entitled to say that my views appear to be inconsistent. I'm arguing for fairness, which Lady Smith said didn't apply to Section 29 on the one hand, in relation to the time limit, but not in relation to where there is a will. Well, uh, I'm a great believer in the freedom of testation. And I can see that there might be hard cases. For example, a couple have lived together as cohabitants uh, very happily for 20 years. One of them dies and it's suddenly discovered that there is a, an outstanding unrevoked will from 22 years beforehand, before the couple had even met. But that will is still valid and rules. That is a hard case. However, let's take the same couple who've lived together for 20 years. One of them dies and it's discovered that six months prior to his death, he had made a will in terms of which he may have left a very small benefit to his uh, partner, but he had left the bulk of his estate elsewhere. Is that not a clear example of the freedom of testation, ladies and gentlemen? And should our courts be interfering in such a situation? I'm expressing a personal viewpoint. You must make up your own minds. Um, I want to conclude today by 
just mentioning in passing the view of the Kishners. Uh, I have to thank uh, Royal Sun Alliance for sharing some of their experiences in relation to Section 29 cases with me. Uh, but very briefly, the comments made by RSA are as follows. RSA now regard a cohabitant who makes a claim under Section 29 as just another potential creditor of the estate, albeit a creditor who ranks below other creditors and the spouses or civil partners' prior rights and legal rights. Whether beneficiaries in intestate estate who are under the age of 16, RSA do not like their entitlement from the estate to be renounced or reduced because the executor or other beneficiaries wish to settle the claim without having to go to court. Uh, having said that, RSA have had no claims yet on executory bonds where Section 29 of the 2006 Act has been involved. It is the view of RSA that when Section 29 first came into effect, most executors were at that time keen to seek the decision of the court. That is not their perception of the current trend, as it would appear from their experience that most such claims are now settled out of court. Although interestingly, RSA told me that they have been involved in one case where the decision of the court was made prior to the bond having been applied for by the executor data. Uh, RSA have found that a small number of solicitors have omitted deliberately or otherwise to advise them that a Section 29 claim might be made and they only found out when they made direct inquiry on the point. Um, RSA reckon that they have one executive case per week where there is a Section 29 claim. Uh, that's set against uh, about 50 to 60 applications every week in intestate cases. Uh, RSA did have one case where the cohabitants solicitors received a decision from the court before the executory solicitors had determined the size of other claims in the estate. Um, and interestingly, RSA advised me they were not sure how a sheriff could reach such a decision when other debts were not clearly known. The solicitors acting for the cohabitant claimed the full amount of the award from the executory estate. The executory solicitors refused to agree that the full amount of the award should be made, as this would be putting the cohabitant above real creditors. RSA ad advised me that they agreed with the position adopted by the executive solicitors, and I would have to say that I find that a very strange case, and I also agree with the position adopted by the executive solicitors. RSA have also had to deal with a small number of cases where, for whatever, sorry, where for whatever reason, a claim was not made within the required six-month period, or perhaps because the parties were not cohabiting at the time of death. They have indicated to me that such claims appear to be based on unjustified enrichment. However, if you look at the case of Courtney's executors against Campbell, which I mentioned a few moments ago, you will see that in that case where the one-year time limit was missed in relation to a Section 28 claim, the executors of one of the cohabitants then sought to base their claim on unjustified enrichment, and Lord Beckett said quite clearly in his judgment they could not do that. Where there had been a statutory remedy available to them and they had missed the time limit in that, it would take exceptional circumstances for the court to accept that the parties had an alternative common law claim, i.e. Unjust unjustified enrichment. I hope you will see from what I've said today that Section 29, uh, although it has been useful um, and is based on reasonable principles, the way it was drafted was not good and it has caused our clients and our profession great angst. And that is probably why, as RSA have indicated, the great number of cases are now settled without going to court. The uh, Scottish Parliament has it within its power to rectify what I think is an unfairness. I earnestly hope that it will do so within a reasonable timescale. Thank you for listening today.